One of the best moments I have of you is before we actually went to Confederations Cup, we were in Chicago. We played Honduras in the World Cup qualifier. We all went out to the underground. You know, B's is Chicago. He's got it all set up. So we're at a table. Drake's in the club. J.R. Smith, he's playing for the Bulls in the club. And we're all kind of situated in the corner. And like, it was probably two in the morning, I want to say, like things are really bumping. I turn around. It's a vivid description, hey. a vivid story. Hey, Chuck, Chuck Deasy was out and about. Yes, Chuck Deasy. I turn around and it felt like the dance floor parted <laughs> and I just see Landon like this. <laughs> Stand up and show us. He was like, he was vibing. Landon Donovan, you're the guest that we thought we would never get. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, the two greatest players that the USA has ever produced, right? And there's this perception, at least, that you two don't like each other. From who? From you? N no, not from me personally. Dude, I, I think love, widely I love, that love, perception I, exists. That's not lost I on you, Landon. Mo you know that. What? <laughs> <laughs> you see that laugh? Yeah, he's been practicing. See, I didn't, I didn't laugh. He's been thinking about this all week. <laughs> What's the first thing I can say? I honestly, honestly though, I feel like then this is just how I feel. I feel like we get along better after playing than we did when we were playing. I think we were so competitive, so focused on winning and, and driven that we didn't really probably appreciate the moments, or I, maybe I didn't appreciate the moments as well because I, I could be a little bit more cutthroat. Um, I can't speak for how you felt, but I feel now it feels like it's more light and more, um, we can more banter than what we used to have. Yeah, so I, it, I was actually thinking about this last night. I was thinking we both came from the same, not from the same places, but the same, we had the same intentions. We loved winning and we were competitive as fuck, right? And so sometimes we went at it different ways. I hated, because of the way I grew up, confrontation. You don't mind confrontation in any way, <laughs> it's an understatement. So at times, we probably did this even without knowing it. And I remember there were times where you guys know this, where like Eddie Johnson was like your boy, right? And you guys were fine. And then all of a sudden something would happen and y'all just fucking hated each other. And you'd be like, fuck you, Eddie, fuck you. If I... And then three minutes later, you guys would be on the field like, oh, what's up? <laughs> You know, like... Yeah, dysfunctional you know, family. Yeah, but, but you had the ability to, like... You almost needed that kind of edge, and I wanted the opposite. I wanted, like, everyone to be happy and together, but in different ways, we achieved the same thing. But now it's been really fun, like, being in Qatar together was nice to spend time away from the competitive vibe, kind of get to know each other better, and I think in the end, we're a lot more similar than we are, than we are different, so... Yeah, I agree with that. Was that, like, probably the... I don't know. So I remember after Qatar, we were at that party in LA for the Fox, like the wrap-up party, whatever, and you kind of mentioned that, like, you guys hadn't spent a lot of time together and that you actually enjoyed it, that that was kind of a cool I moment. I loved it, yeah. Yeah. When you go into national team camp, you're there for like three or four days, and so if there's people you play with together, you know them a lot better, but you come into camp, you're there three days, like, you're on a mission to just do what you need to do, and then you leave. So you don't spend any th real time together, necessarily. And so you don't get to know people sometimes. So it's been nice to actually just spend time with you guys too, just to spend time and get to know people. Where, where did you feel there was a moment with had the most confrontation between you two? No, I think there was probably jealousy on both sides because he was doing things I couldn't do. You know, like he was thriving in Europe, scoring goals in Champions League, doing things. And I went for short stints. Europa League, not Champions League. Sorry, I didn't make it that low. similar. Europa close, League, close sorry, in, in big games. <laughs> And I had never had the ability to do that. And so I was like, fuck, I wish I could have done that. But I did get to be home and play and in front of friends and family and thrive in, in MLS. And you know, I'm not sure, you probably didn't want to do that, but there were, there were times where I was rooting for him when we were together. And then there was times where I was like, fuck, he's like, he's like doing things I wish I could have done. So, but that also drove me. Cause so I was like, when we came together, like we were, together, on the team together, but like probably wanting to one-up each other and do better and do better, and that drove the national team. And also, I, I, I noticed a shift in terms of like our positions. We kind of gravitated towards the same position, whereas before, I saw you more of a withdrawn forward. You could be a number nine, but under Bob Bradley, we both wanted to be on the left side and coming our dominant foot on the right, so we would always have this kind of like, who's gonna play in that position? A little bit of beef there, but at the same time, 
it was like trying to find that balance. Who won that? The beef. Man, you know he it's got the pay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But it's all good. No, you that's know, not right? yeah, all right. <laughs> no, but yeah. you said ability. But you had the ability to play. Yeah, I guess I just didn't have I didn't have the um I didn't have the ability to like stick it out in the hard times the way it did. So Deuce is that did. mentality? Yeah, in some ways. But I was also if I had really put myself to it and put my mind to it, I could have done it. Right. Did you Maybe not consider not, Everton a successful period? I did, but I didn't stay long, mm -hmm. right? Like, it grinded and grinded for a long time. I went through all the ups and downs that I didn't want to deal with. I wanted to just, I always wanted to be playing. I didn't want to go through the periods where I wasn't playing. And so, and that was like a softness on my part. But I loved what I was achieving in LA and, and with the national team at home. But he had the ability to just deal with all that. And I don't know, I mean, you, it's probably more just the way you grew up and how you were like hardened over the years. I didn't have anyone tell me early on, say, hey man, sometimes you're not gonna play. Just fucking deal with it, you know? So I would go and when I wasn't playing, I was like, what am I doing here? I wanna get out of here instead of just fighting for a month or two and like earning your place and, and doing it that way. Did Leverkusen scar you? Was, was it like that Yeah, a little experience? bit, but I, so I grew up, you know, at 17, I just went to Leverkusen. I had no mentor, I knew nothing. I didn't even know what Leverkusen was. I had no idea. I didn't know it was a city, a town, that a, a team. I knew nothing about it. So I go there. You're not getting the opportunities you think you should get, even though I wasn't anywhere near good enough for that team. And then all of a sudden, it's like, well, what am I doing here? And I should have had, I wish I had people who said, hey, man, just stick with it. You didn't have anyone saying, there's going to be hard times to fight through that. And then you just said, right now, I wish I had. Who are those people? Like, you're talking about like coaches, like, like family, or what are you Anyone are former to? players, but it wasn't, their, it wasn't their job to reach out. Like, take um, the Geo situation in the World Cup, right? So, like, you need people who in those moments can say, hey, man, I know you're upset, you're not playing, you're not starting, but this is the way you handle it. And when I had those moments, I didn't have anyone helping me get through those moments. And maybe you guys did, I don't know. I don't know if your brother or your family or, you know, but I didn't have anyone who could just say, or maybe you just on your own were like, I just know what it is, I'm gonna deal with it. I just felt like it was always a grind for me. I felt like I was never the person that was supposed to make it. I felt like mm -hmm. I always had this huge, like, kind of chip on my shoulder. And not to say that you didn't go through those times, but when I think of you and Beasley, I think of y'all in the World Cup in South Korea and how y'all were thriving and, and playing on the world stage, getting to the quarterfinals, and and and, give it, and really could have beat Germany in in, in that quarterfinal game. So, uh, you know, I was always thinking, all right, that's that's what you're shooting for. You know, you want to be a guy that can come in and, and break in like a Bobby Convy, like an Eddie Johnson, like even in MLS. I was not a player that was mm -hmm. seen on y'all's level um, to make the money that y'all were making. And then, for, so for me, it was like. I wanted to go to Europe after the World Cup because it was like, it's always been a grind, but I want to test myself against the best and see if I'm if I'm good enough. The World Cup gave me a little idea that maybe, you know, I was could maybe do it. And then for me, it was like giving me that peace to go over there and try, you know? Just to go back to the Leverkusen experience, because for people who, who weren't aware of what your experience was who there, that's a, a big <laughs> German side who traditionally are always in and around the European places, if not Champions League in mm -hmm. that period of time, then, then Europe, right? So it, it's you going over to a club where expectations are high. Yeah. Uh, how do you look back on that experience? Well, that, that particular team too, one of the years I was there, I think it was 01, they, they were in the final of Champions League. They were in the Champions oh, League wow. final. And so there were, they were just way, way, way better than I was at that time and maybe ever. How old were you at that time? I was 17, 18. That's crazy. So, and I thought in my head, though, what an idiot, like, I should be playing too, right? And it was so stupid to think about that at that time. But the feeling is the same, right? You're, you're upset and disappointed that you're not, anytime you go through a stretch where you're not playing, you're like, I should be playing because, you know, we're egotistical professional athletes. We think we should be playing. So that was, yeah, that was hard for me. And at the time, the easiest way out was go back to America, be around my friends and family, and have a chance to play at home. So, so when you make that decision, though, right? You're 17, you're 18, you've taken a big leap. You've gone over there, you say, fuck it, I'm gonna put myself in an uncomfortable situation. I wanna play, I'm gonna show that I should play. And then, like you just said, it's not going well, and now you're at a crossroads, you gotta make a decision. Who are the people you talk to? Rich. Like, trying to 
my agent. Rich was the main one? Yeah, I mean, because he was the only one who understood it in any way. I didn't have, there was nobody else I could speak to. My parents didn't understand what was going on. So Rich many, many times sort of talked me off the ledge, like just give it a few more weeks, just keep working hard, keep training, things will happen. And I just reached a point, and he could feel it too, where I said, I just, I can't do this. This is, I'm here to play at a high level. I'm not here to just practice every day. You don't strike me as somebody who struggles to cope with pressure. No, that, that's not how you come across, certainly like the version of you that I've gotten to know through doing broadcasting with you. Mm -hmm. Do you look back at that time and wish you could have handled it differently? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's weird to say I'm so happy the way it all turned out. My life, like I believe the world's happening the way it's supposed to. I really, truly believe that. But I also wish I had the ability to just, it's, it, wasn't, it wasn't a pressure thing. I wasn't, it wasn't that I couldn't handle pressure. Mm. It was that I just, I was miserable there. It was, you know, dark and cold most days. I would go to training for an hour and a half, which I enjoyed a, for the most part. And then I'd go sit at home and do nothing all day for 20 other hours of the day. And so do you that think was it was the, the transition to Germany that made it all that much probably. harder? Different yeah, culture, probably. language, all of that. Whereas probably. England felt like an easier transition? No question. And in England, I had Tim there. Tim Howard was there. So like that trans and that locker room, the team, the language, all that made it much easier. Um, to your point, I had I had McBride, Boca Negra, right. yeah, that that, made, that helps that made, a lot. That made a At least difference. you immediately know you're coming. I mean, the first day of training, Tim picked me up and took me to training, right? So I had this nice. connection that made it a lot easier. It makes you think about other foreigners who come into your teams when you were playing, like how hard it must have been for them, you know? And but yeah, I think a, another country probably would have been easier. It wasn't the easiest place for a 17-year-old from California to go. Do you think you feel fulfilled your potential uh, as a player? No, as 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 other people would see it. But I don't. I, but why, as why, other people but why would see it. Why'd you say that? No, no, no. I could have been a better. I could have played at a higher level. No question. Because I just think of that no goal question. in Confederations Cup final against Brazil, mm -hmm. and just seeing you operate. Humble brag right there. <laughs> seeing you assist. operate at a... Yeah, you like that, dude? You know, you know, you know, you know, you know, I didn't say nothing about my assist. But you knew he was going to come back. I know you only scored one goal hey, in your he career. He couldn't talk no. about the Algeria. Who assisted on that goal? <laughs> yeah, you couldn't talk about the Algeria goal, bro. You want to talk about that one? No, I want to talk about oh, this one just because you assisted I saw it. No, You saw real close because you passed it to him. Maybe. But you you just had like this composure in that that final second before the shot. And I, I, I remember leaving that being like, how are you not playing Champions League? How are you, you know, you're quote unquote the best American. How are you not playing in Champions League when everyone else is like playing in Europe? And I just felt like I didn't yeah, never I mean, heard look, from you. I, th and part of going to Everton was I wanted to show myself that I could do that, right? What I learned at Everton is after, I think I was there 13 games the first time, I was exhausted. I mean, like, I can't explain, you know it, but I, like, I right. cannot explain how hard that league is. And that was 13, that was Especially a third of the season. December to, to February, crazy. it's a grind. It was crazy. And so I just, could I have played at that? Of course, I, I, I could have. And as far as fulfilling potential in that way, looking at like in that silo, yeah, there was a lot more to fulfill, a lot more. You use the word soft, which I think you were using to kind of be, you know, to be, to be humble in some way and kind of give Clint his props for how he did perform in Europe. But is that ever a way you would look at, like, American players now in Europe? Would you say, hey, if you don't make it over there, you're soft? It's a mentality thing? Because I don't Not think always. you would, but that no. seems to be how you speak about yourself. Yeah, I, I think when I say soft, I mean not having, I, I just, I have to give myself some credit. I mean, I, I spent two years there right. as, a, as a teenager, which is a lot, right? It's not like after a week, I was like, I'm out of here. Um, but it's a different mentality. At that time, playing in MLS was easy from a pressure. Nobody cared. If you had a bad game, nobody cared. And in being in Europe, like I remember being at Leverkusen and being, I remember, I'll never forget this. We played, I played with the reserve team. So we played a reserve team game in the big stadium 
for whatever reason, and there are probably a few thousand people there. I remember making a bad pass and hearing, I mean, just hearing people go, ugh, right? And like, and I was like, damn, yeah, it's just a bad pass. I mean, I was trying, you know, like, and I remember, I'll never forget like that feeling of like, oh, wow, this is way more serious. You know, uh -huh. like this actually means something to these people, which is good, you want that. But at the time I wasn't ready for that, I wasn't, so. When you were making like those decisions, like was your position with the national team, I guess 17, 18 years, going through that period of like, slowly climbing the ranks, getting into the national pool and all that kind of stuff. But like, was that on your mind as well? Yeah. Because you've done so well. Like he just said, like Charlie yeah. said, you just won the golden ball. So like, from a US standpoint, we're like, this is the next guy. Like he's, he's I was the on the verge one. of like breaking in to get, to get called into camp. Yeah. But I do remember Rich telling me that when he would have conversations with Bruce, he would say, I need to be playing. Yeah. I need to be playing somewhere else. I'm not gonna get a chance. It's gonna be hard for him to bring an 18 year old anyway into camps but if you're not playing at all it's almost impossible and so that was that also was part of it for sure needed that makes me think about um i think it was a fox broadcast sometime recently i think you were on the show too and you were talking about christian pulisic and saying hey listen i think oh. he should come back to mls <laughs> mm -hmm. i don't think he should have signed for ac milan a team that reached the semi-finals of the champions league last season right? that. Okay, i didn't say ahead. i don't think he should sign for i just thought Playing in MLS is a good option for him, especially ahead of the World Cup. Why, if you look back at your time in Europe and think, man, mm -hmm. I wish I could have had that, why would you want that Well, for actually, him? that's why, because I, I, and I don't think this will happen, I think, and he's shown already that he's doing very well there, but as you guys know, there are periods you go through where you might not be playing, right? If he's in MLS, he's gonna play every minute for the next, however long he decides to, unless, you know, he gets injured. At AC Milan in the, in the winter, they might sign another player that's, that they think is better than him. If it's six months in January of 2026 and he's not playing through then, that's a risk, right? It's a risk. Now, the other side of that coin is if he's playing at the highest level leading into the World Cup, then that's great for him. And he's gonna be performing at a really high level. I just, I, I don't think it would be the worst option in the world. And maybe it can be both. Maybe if things aren't going well at Milan, which I think they are so far, and I hope that it continues. Maybe he can go on loan somewhere. Maybe it's not MLS, but somewhere where he's playing. My point is, he needs to be playing mm -hmm. ahead of the World Cup. This is a moment we all wish we had. A World Cup in, in America would be an absolute dream to play in a World Cup in our home country, and he needs to be playing, as, as does everyone else. You know, Gio's another guy who, if he's not playing a lot, he needs to go somewhere and play, in my he's, opinion. He needs to stay fit. He needs to stay fit, yeah. But you got to play too. If yeah. you're not playing ahead of a World Cup, you're not going to give yourself the best chance to succeed. Mm -hmm. I remember I, I was like, when you first said that to me, when we were doing the production meeting, I was like, this man must have lost his damn mind. Like, are you out of here? <laughs> but the other part that you added to it, though, and I, I thought that part had more credibility or made more sense than the playing part. Because the playing part, I always feel like, first of all, I think Christian's elite, right? I think that him, I don't think he's even reached his potential yet. I think there's still room for growth, and then he's going to, to get yeah. to reach that level, I think being in that kind of environment where nothing's guaranteed, where today he might play, they had that Champions League game, he didn't start, right? Mm -hmm. He had started off well there, played the Champions League game, a big part of why he wanted to go to a club of AC Milan's pedigree, because they were in but, Champions League. But what do you think, but what do you think is better fair, though? Do you, think, do you think playing week in, week out with MLS, or you think starting some games, coming on, let's just say in like the 60th minute with like a, a team that you know, is playing in Champions League, or you, or, or you know how in so many competitions you might be rested for one but play for the other. I mean, he did show, just to look at the other side of the coin, he did show for not playing as much with Chelsea, he was still able to have a strong World Cup in Qatar with, with his performances. I do agree with you, though, that you're only going to be better the more, the more that you play, but my question is to you, what do you think is, is, is better, to be starting week in and week out with MLS, or to be playing still significant minutes, maybe sometimes you're the first person subbed off, maybe sometimes you're the per first person subbed on, but at a team playing in one of the best leagues in the world. I mean, I personally think that you're asking about just a player in general or for Christian? It's Either same, way, right? I mean, yeah. it's the same. No, it's not the same, because a player in general, right, some players have different motivations, some players have different ambitions, right? Some players are seeking a certain are seeking to just be a professional athlete, to just be a pro. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think Christian's goal is he can be one of the best in the world. Well, I mean, I, th I think if you're trying to be the best, you need to be around the best players in the world. And so that for me, it's playing in the best leagues in the world. Like I always saw myself as a soccer player. 
I play soccer. I don't practice. I'm not a traveling. I'm not part of the squad. I play soccer. That's what I do. So I wanted to play soccer. Could I have gone elsewhere and played it as much? Not as much, no. Not, not the way it was in MLS. Do you have a so relationship did, with Christian? Did you reach out to him during that period? Not, not I haven't spoke to him much in life. Um, he's, you know, he's fortunate to have, I feel like he has good people around him who keep him grounded and his dad, obviously, and I don't know who else he speaks to, but he feels, it feels to me like he has good people around him. I mean, Mo said something about, his, like, you think his trajectory or his desire is to be one of the best in the world. He's on, on course for breaking your guys' joint all-time top goal scorer for the U.S. men's national team record, right? Not the assist record. Okay. <laughs> no one cares about do, assists do you think except he, you against Brazil. Do you think he has the ability to surpass you two in terms of what you represent and mean for the U.S. men's national team? Not just the goal, the goal scoring, but just also like the iconic status. Well, that's subjective, right? Yeah. So like, what's your subjective you, opinion you, on you it? You have you have no bigger opportunity than 2026. Yeah, if so you true. do it there so on such a great level, you'll forever be a legend. Even, even though you've already done a lot, but if you do it on home soil in front of everybody when they're watching, to take it to another level here in the States. What does that no mean, though, take it to another level? Do you have to get past round of 16? Do you have to get to quarterfinals? For sure you have to get into the knockout rounds, but like get further than what Landon and Beasley did in, in terms of the quarterfinal. So get to a semifinal, so you, so you, get to a final. Do you think that if he doesn't, if they don't get to, if they, let's say they get to... I'm not saying that. Because the only reason I say that is because I'm just I agree he, he with you. Has the, he has the opportunities, yeah. what I'm saying. I agree with you, because I think that... Because I'm right. not going to put a limit on what he, he needs is. to do to get to that level. Right. I agree that the, pl that the opportunity is the 2026 World Cup if it's here. And he's already on an incredible trajectory. But I guess what came to mind straight away when you brought that up was like, well, 94 World Cup was here, yeah. right? And then right Changed after the 94 everything. World Cup, so many of those guys, their status is elevated. When I think of the players that have the most prominence, the players that are still kind of the faces and have relevancy and are kind of I've spoken a, in an elite status, it's, in my mind, it's you 2 it's Bees, Timmy. it's Tim Howard, and maybe Claudio, right? And so my point of that is like, is it just that he has to have a good World Cup in that World Cup and that's gonna just suddenly have him surpass you guys or is there more that needs to happen for that to become a reality? We're talking about, it's a, like I said, it's a subjective question, right? So it's people's opinion. But to Deuce's point, a World Cup at home, there are going to be hundreds of millions of people in our country paying attention, right? Maybe not watching every match, but knowing what's going on. That's never happened before. And so it's, the opportunity is like five to ten times bigger than anything any of us ever experienced. Just the opportunity. So if he does it there, he's going to be... If he has an iconic goal in the tournament or the team does really well, yeah, he's going to surpass everything we did. Thierry Henry said that he would take your generation, U.S. men's national team, over the current generation. He liked the, the Why heart. Why did he say that? Yeah. The heart that this team had. Do you agree with that? Yeah. I can't. I'm not in the camp all the time, so I can't speak to it. But you kind of immediately said, yeah. You nodded agree. Well, I actually... I, it's more of a generational question, right? And we had to, like, we had to fight for everything we got. I mean, like, like our home games were not home games. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? But they were they're not always, now. They're more so. No, they're, they're much more, more so, so than now, what we no. had. Really? It, it's for I mean, sure more so than what we my, had. My my first game with the national team was in the LA Coliseum against Mexico, and there were sixty five thousand people there. 64,000 at least were Mexicans. I mean, it was like scary. I mean, you have to be and so is... strategic on how you put these games for World Cup qualifying at home to have a pro-American crowd. And it was even worse when we played. But I even mean like it's gotten just better, growing right? up, right? Like in Fontana and Nacogdoches, where'd you grow up? Manchester, New Hampshire. Manchester, New Hampshire. I just drove through there. <laughs> um, in Redlands where I go, it was just, it was different and the time was different because no one cared about soccer. And there was just a different feeling. And you had to really fight. And I think about the generation before, I'm a little bit older, like before ours, those guys, it was even worse. I mean, they got paid like a few hundred bucks a game to play. It was their livelihood. If they didn't make the national team, they didn't eat, right? And so like 
there, there's something about that that you can't, you can't like put a price tag on and, and it translates to this hunger and desire for success and to be the best that we were talking about in the very beginning. And I don't know that all these kids have that all the time. I don't care what anyone says, that adds like a level of success that you can't quantify. I just wonder what kind of family you come from. Was like, was playing a struggle for you guys financially in any oh, way? Oh yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, my my dad was an electrician. He probably made twenty grand a year. My mom made thirty grand a year as a teacher. We didn't. I could if I didn't have someone driving me around to practices, I wouldn't have been able to to play. And you, what, you would hop in the car with someone else's yep. parents? they would drive 45 minutes to pick me up and take me to practice. Wow. So like, but there's, there's a level of struggle that's healthy, because when you get in big moments, big games, you're like, this is fucking easy, compared to eating fucking hot dogs and scrounging for food every day, you know? So it's, that struggle helps you a lot. It does, when you get in the big moments, it helps. Red Hill Park? Red Hill Park, you know it, Mo. I never knew, I felt like you were always guarded in a way, like um, you didn't let people in. And really? Yeah, like mm. I didn't really know you know you. You know, like there's some people you get a little sense of like, I knew what, how, how Mo operated, what he, what, where he came from and certain teammates, but it always felt like you had like this bubble around you or and I don't know. You think that was like my doing? <sighs> like I put that off? I'm I, asking honestly. Yeah, I don't. no, um, I think it was, well one, you, everyone just looked at you as like the golden child. You know, right. the 2002 World Cup kind of really set you to be carrying the torch, being like the, the top American player. And I just felt that you weren't kind of uh, as open. Everyone was kind of tiptoeing around you. Yeah. Who were you um, tight with? Me? Yeah. Through the years? Bees, because yeah. I grew up with Bees playing. I hung out with Ching a lot. Ching, yeah. Man. Brian Ching. Yeah, and I'm in big red. <laughs> Look at my iPad, look at his photos. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you say Hanneman? Yeah, Hanneman. Bro, he loved to show a photo, but. God, what a guy he was. Um, mostly those guys, yeah. But again, with the national team, you're not around them all the time. So it's like you come in and out. But I can see why you say it. Like, even at, in coaching and in San Diego Loyal, people, like players, staff, whatever, I always feel like they're tiptoeing around. And the irony is that I'm like, the most open, like I'll talk about anything, publicly, privately, whatever, and I like to be open, And but I can see why you say that, because a lot of people have said that to me. Oh, I was telling these guys before, because when we were talking about you coming on the show, I said that, I said the same thing, that like, I feel like in post-career, that I've gotten to know you more, mm -hmm. right? And maybe it's because, I don't know, part of it maybe is similar to what Charlie was saying, there was a kind of like aura, or like a, where, it wasn't as easy for us as younger players coming into the team to kind of like find a way to relate in the mm -hmm. same way. Whereas now, like we have so many things that we, we probably had a lot more in common back then that I just never even realized. Yeah. But now fast forward, I feel like we've had, there's been dad way more three, moments. Dad of three, That's what I'm mm -hmm. saying. There, there's just so many more moments that I feel like we connect and like it's easier yeah. to just be open and have conversations about different things. Well, I've heard that from a lot of people before. It's probably how I felt with you too. Yeah, like I, was I was guarded. You were very guarded, yeah. and so it was hard for me to connect in that way. But also, the similarity probably with us is that I was so driven, Mo, to succeed. Like, it's hard to explain. Yeah. It was, it, it just consumed, it was an obsession. And so anything that was gonna detract from that, I didn't wanna even risk it. So if you were helping that, it was almost like, like almost narcissistic in a way. Like. It, it, I needed everyone to help me because I wanted to succeed. Not personally, but like I want, well, early in my career personally, later in my career, I just wanted to win, 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 like win everything. And so I wanted, and if there was, it was, that's probably what it was. It's like, you guys would be like, let's go out and have a beer. And I'd be like, fuck that. I'm going to go home and drink water and get ready for training tomorrow. You know, which is, you know, some of that I probably regret a little bit. But it's, we probably it, we got the beer. <laughs> <laughs> Although, I, 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 but the best moment, one of the best moments I have of you, is before we actually went to Confederations Cup, we we're in Chicago, we played Honduras in the World Cup qualifier, we all went out to the underground. You know, B's is Chicago. He's got it all set up. <laughs> so we're at a table, 
Drake's in the club, J.R. Smith, he's playing for the Bulls in the club. And we're all kind of situated in the corner. And like, it was probably two in the morning, I want to say, like things are really bumping. <laughs> I turn around. It's a vivid, Chuck, just, it's hey, a vivid story. Hey, Chuck, Chuck Deasy was out and about. <laughs> yes, Chuck Deasy. I turn around and it felt like the dance floor parted, <laughs> and I just see Landon like this. <laughs> Stand up and show us. He was like, he was vibing. And I was like, oh, okay. And, and that's when I was like, oh. Like, Happened once do, in a while. Yeah, yeah you do you mix it up. Yeah. No. <laughs> oh, stop it. When I'm listening to them, though, I wonder, did you, did you feel isolated at times? Uh, well, I probably isolated myself. Uh -huh. It's not like anyone did And did you did feel comfortable in that? Yeah. Well, I've always been, like, looking back at my early childhood, when you're, when you grow up with depression or you have a propensity for depression, you want to, like, in those moments, you want to be isolated. So when I was, when I would go home, like, after school, I'd be in my room for hours just by myself because that was where I found most peace. And also, in that way, very introverted and get a lot of energy through that. And then I can go out in the world and do stuff like this. Mm -hmm. But, like, after this today, I want to go to my hotel room and just sit for a few hours and just be like quiet. I can't like just keep going. I get going. it. And so, in that way, I probably just the, like the level of emotion and intensity in training and playing at this level. It was exhausting for me. So I wanted to go home and just be by myself. And that's probably like where they were like, "Let's go to dinner. Let's do something else." You know, sometimes I would do it, but I regret not doing it more. You mentioned the word depression. Right? That was one of the things I wanted to ask you about because I feel like you were one of the first professional athletes I saw openly speak about mental health. Like now it's almost, it's, it can be a trend to speak about mental health now. People don't feel the same level of shame attached to that. But I feel like when you first spoke out about that, that was a while back and it felt a little different to me. Hmm. Did you feel like you were breaking a barrier at that point? Did you feel that there was a kind of a level of shame attached around the subject? and? and this is something I want to break out of somehow? It wasn't, it wasn't conscious or intentional. I just, I had gone through so much therapy and I was so, um, well, proud, but also just at peace with it. Mm -hmm. That when someone would ask me a question that would trigger that or to, I would just speak about it. It wasn't like I was like, this is the time I will go speak about okay. it and bring it out. And, it just felt I just natural. felt at, I just felt at peace with it, and I could speak about it for the first time, and that's actually really relieving because for so long I didn't know what this feeling was. I didn't know how to identify it, and it's not like I wasn't going through every day just in full. But there were moments every few weeks or once a month where I would feel this, and I go, "What is that? I couldn't figure it out." And so feeling it and knowing what it was, identifying it helped me a lot. And then I just felt like, "Why not talk? Who cares?" How uh, old were you when you started therapy? Uh, 25? Was there, if this is too personal, say so, but was there a point like... It's not that, too personal, Kate. ...that made you feel like, hey, I need, I need help here? No, it was my, my previous wife, Bianca, had gone to uh, a woman who, she was going to like some meditation classes. And then through that, she started seeing this woman for therapy, mm. and she would come home and be like, you know, I think you should really talk to this woman. And I'd be like, I'm fine, I don't need to talk to anybody, da da da. But then finally I was like, you know what, I'll just go see her one time, and that's how it started. What were, like, what were some of the things that you would talk about in, in therapy that I guess warranted why you would we need? We talked about you, Deuce. Damn, what I, what I, what I do wrong? deep shit. She would pay attention, she would watch Game. She didn't know anything about soccer, but she would watch because she could see in my face, like during national anthem or on the field, she could tell when things were going on. Like she was very perceptive in that way. So we would, there's like, we all have things from our childhood that shape us, good and bad, right? Like there's things you went through, I'm sure pretty gnarly, like your accident, right? Like things that had not only in your childhood, but just in life, right? That, that really shape who we are. And so when you're a kid, you don't realize what all that is. It's just forming your mind and your brain in different ways. So one, just being able to speak about it like openly as to what it is. But then two, I did a lot of healing because I had a lot of pain from my childhood. Like my parents split when I was two. I watched my parents 
not watch. I used to sit on the phone with the old rotary. You guys don't even know. Like, I know. Old I know, but I know, but my grandma on, was, had one of them. Uh, I'm not that young. Right. Right. I was like, what? <laughs> man, I, hey, they man. didn't even know about. Hey, they didn't even know about one eight hundred collect with ask for your name. Oh, like, hey, I'm at the high school. Thing. 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 Yeah, right we knew about. We just didn't say nothing about it. All right, my bad, dude. Just because we didn't all co-sign using it, didn't mean we didn't know about it. You didn't know. Okay, my bad. Damn. They sign and pick me up. I'm gonna have to go to therapy now. Shit. Would you ever go to therapy? I'd be open to it. Would you? You know what I'm saying? I, I don't think that there's... You're pretty aware now, though. Like, the, the goal of it is to bring awareness to all the things you do and all, like... But I also feel like, yeah, I agree. I've never been to therapy, but just hearing you talk about it and just, like, from people that I know who have gone to it for various different reasons, I think it's about bringing awareness to it, but I think there's also certain things that we're oblivious to. Like, I get reminded on a daily basis, right or wrong, <laughs> about different things that I just do because it's just become routine to me, right? And then I'm just constantly doing them. Like, my missus will be like, bro, you realize you're doing X, Y, and Z. Or I'm looking for change in certain things. And she's like, all right, you also recognize your position in this dynamic or in this household. You got to set the tone to allow those things to, to happen. I was, I remember being like seven years old on the phone with my dad at home with my mom. And my dad would be like, tell your mom, da, 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 da. And I'd be like, my dad said, uh, seven. My dad said, da, da, da. And she'd be like, well, tell him, da, da, da. And I'd be like, dad, she, this is on the phone as a set, uh, like, inner, it's like, that's not healthy for a seven year old, yeah. right? And so like all those little things shape you, but just getting to identify them, know what they are, know why I act a certain way. Makes you feel more, more in control when you can identify things and understand yeah, your behavior. Yeah, and you just behavior. don't react to it. You know, right. like you yeah. don't let your body just take over and, and make stupid reaction, reactive decisions. You know, you can be like, oh, I know why I'm doing that because my dad used to do that or my mom used to yell at me like that. That's why I'm yelling at my son. And you can take a step back and be like, okay, do I really need to do that? Maybe. I always thought you dealt with pressure so well. Right. Whether it was penalties, big games, I'd see how you But focused. soccer was the easy part for me yeah. because like that's where I was at peace. Like it was all easy off the field. And when the off the field got better, the soccer got better. So in the height of my therapy, like three or four years in, I was 28, 29, it was right during the, con those were my best two years, 09 and 2010, not even close. Confederations Cup, I was like at my best, best, best. And that was when I was like really shedding a lot of all this old shit in my life and like coming, coming to terms with it, being at peace with it. So during that time, I was just free. It was the first time I truly felt free. I'm like getting goosebumps. Like I felt free in my life just to like, just be okay with who I am. And then it showed on the field because I was just at peace, you know? You mentioned, I think you were kind of like half joking, but I said, I remember talking about you, Clint, in therapy. Did, did that rivalry, because you've talked about like I was driven to win. Did you want to, that rivalry with Clint that we all perceived that you had, w was that present for you mentally as well? My biggest challenge with you was I felt like you didn't, um, not that you didn't appreciate me because I knew you did, but like you were constantly competing with me. And I think subconsciously I was competing with you. But at the time, it's not like I wasn't competing for goals or whatever, I was just competing like I want to be the best. And I knew you wanted to be the best. And it made us the best. And it made our team the best. But my, actually my favorite, I don't know if you remember this, but we both had to leave Gold Cup to go to something. Did you go to someone's that. wedding yeah, or I something? I remember that. I remember everything. Did you, I, remember I went that. somewhere and you, Basically, I where I went. Basically, and... uh, my sister was having a wedding. Yeah. I had said before the tournament to Bob, Bob was always like, just be transparent with me. That's what I respect about Bob Bradley. Like, he, he, he was who he was. As long as you're real with him, he's gonna be real with you. I said, look, Bob, if I don't go, to the Gold Cup, I understand, but my sister's having a wedding. I've missed all the things in her life doing everything for me. So I understand if you don't want to take me, but during this time, yeah. I need to go to my sister's wedding. And I remember, like, we just we, we got through the group, but we just had a game, I think, in Kansas City versus a team that we should have beat. Yeah. And I remember Stephen Trundolo, like, being like, oh, you got to do better, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, what do you think? You think I'm fucking trying to not score goals, bro? <laughs> like, I want to score as many goals as I fucking can, dude. Like, get the fuck out of my face, bro. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then it was like, Marcus Hanneman started talking shit to me. And I was like, bro, Marcus, you need to sit the that fuck down, down bro. Was... You trying to be everybody's friend, I don't give a fuck about you right now. You know, and Bob's like, you know, maybe I was, I was wrong. I should have subbed you, Clint. I was like, you should have subbed me? What the fuck are you talking about, man? I had your back the whole damn time with everything, man. Like, 
You know what I'm saying? The next thing I know, Therapy. we both, we end up going, going away. We come back. We beat Jamaica. Go to the final. We win. I mean, yep. Yeah, so we, went, we left. I think we left separately because we had to go separate. And yeah. then how, somehow we ended up on the same plane back together. Do you remember that? I think we came back on a plane together. I don't know. Did you fly into Nacogdoches? Because I flew straight out of Nacogdoches. <laughs> Everybody was feeling a certain way about us leaving. Of yeah, course. I know that. Yeah, there was a big but, conversation. And I was about like, that. bro, we oh. told it wasn't the, the same for him. Were you guys coach. both there? I was there for that. But he was probably. Were you mad about? Were you guys mad about? It, it was a big conversation. Well, you both were gone at the same period of time, and then you know everyone's talking amongst the group. Wait, okay, can somebody explain to me why did you leave? I'm I... trying to figure out. I don't remember. Oh. The interesting part was I was, I was playing. I remember this. I was playing really poorly at the time. I wasn't playing well, like in general, and so. But I remember Bob saying to me, you can go, but when you come back, you know, there's a decent chance you're not going to start. And I actually, at that time, I would have, normally I would have like, like fought him to start, but I was like, you know what, I'm not playing well and I'm leaving, like I kind of get it. But I do remember coming back and because we both left, it was the first time I felt like we were kind of connected in a weird way. I think I hit a shot cross and you scored. Like oh on yeah, the back yeah. Post. That was semifinal game. That was a different that game. That was a semi. That was okay. a semi game. That was but against I remember, Panama. Like, that was against Panama. That was the first. And I celebrated time. with you on that. And I honestly, it was the first time I remember. <laughs> That's like, the first time we celebrated together. Like really celebrated. Because I Wait, normally what? I go run to the crowd. I made a point. To he go said, "Screw Landon." To Landon. <laughs> I do. I remember that. And that and that because there was some weird connection because we had both like we were kind of the same, doing the same things like putting our life first for the first time maybe or something. So you didn't, as a rule in general, up until that point, you hadn't really celebrated each other's goals? Not like no, that, I mean, not did, but I, I'm not saying explicitly. But to go but out of your way, that was like one of the first times. That was one of the first times. So and like also, also we connected, and I don't know if you remember this, but there was a, I don't know if it was the same tournament or another tournament going into the final. You were getting, a lot, you were getting some heat about maybe not getting enough goals or assists. And I was like, you know what, it don't matter. No, if we're in a big game, we always want Landon. He's always gonna come through and you scored in the final. No matter what, I know that if we're in a big game, I know that you, I'd want you out there because you, you're, you're a difference maker. And you're like, man, I really appreciate that. You remember that? Yep, I do. So to your, to your question, Kate, so normally how it would happen is like, hold on. <laughs> what? Normally how it would happen is like if Landon scored, Clint would go drink water on the sideline or something like that. Oh, <laughs> if Clint scored, Landon would drop down and tie his shoe so they had to avoid say, <laughs> celebrating together. Just run back. <laughs> run you, back to you the You two didn't really like each other. It was just True a competitive. It was just a competitive. No, it's not that I didn't like him. I respected him. Respect like, is different to like. I mean, we're totally different people. We're like different likes in life, and like we weren't gonna hang out together. But it's not that I didn't like him. He was just. He was the only. I was like Shrek, player. I had layers, you know, it was difficult to understand. <laughs> He's still like <Yeah>. Shrek. <laughs> a lot of layers. But he was, he was like, he was elite like that. And so it was like, we all want to be the man and the star and all that. And I was like, fuck, this guy's fucking good too, you know? About like, you know, Clint's a freestyler. He was a rapper back in the day. Was any Not of me. that your kind of vibe? <laughs> Here's acoustic what guitar. Do you, think? <laughs> you played acoustic guitar. Wait, stop. You played acoustic no, guitar? I don't play guitar. You were a model, too. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. He was a model at Drinking Water. You I've seen them. Seen water and I have seen this, these pictures. I've seen How them. How long have you been waiting They're to famous. bring that up? I had to. I had to. <laughs> to be fair, to your, to your defense, I, I don't feel like MLS or US soccer, in terms of the media, always put players in the best positions. Mm. That's an understatement. <laughs> Did you, were you aware at the time, hey, I might not like how this shoot turns out? No. I was 20. I didn't know what was going on. You were just posing like, the way wow, they told you to pose. Wow, photo shoot. And yeah. They said, drink hey. the water. Look really thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, hey, I would have been, man, I'm scared of what my photo would look like if I, <laughs> they would have given me that option. Because <laughs> the same thing, I would have been like, Shh, whatever. I didn't know. Um, like, so we joke about certain things. We talk about certain moments. But, like, when you look back on your career, right, like, what's the moment that, you wish your you could like bring that to life and let your kids witness that in real time. If that makes sense. Hmm. Interesting question. It's a no-brainer. Algeria. Algeria. No. 
No. no. That's for you. Maybe that's no. your that's your no brainer. I want to hear what he, you don't know all his experiences. No, I mean like everybody would have said that moment though. I think that's what most people would expect. No, because that's like show my kids. Yeah. I mean like that you're either you're most proud of or like Oh, well that's different. I mean No, there are other things I'm more proud of. Like what? Like that would have been the most exciting moment yeah. for my kids to What's see. What's the proudest? Um Jeez. Maybe my final game with the Galaxy or the national team. Mm -hmm. Because of the reception that you yeah, got from the Yeah, because you don't always feel that or get that in that same way. It's almost like, in a weird way, like witnessing your funeral in some ways, because it's <laughs> the end of what you're doing, you know? And so you don't get to feel that. And that's a really special... Was it the MLS Cup? Was your final game with the yeah. Galaxy? Yeah. Like that, because that, yeah, that's just, that's a different feeling for your kids to witness. The, and your kids could see that and see what you meant to people, to that many people, that's special, you know? Here's my biggest thing to the ladies. The whole time, I didn't want to do it. Who told you that? Do this. Take a look at a sneak peek of next week's episode of Kicking It, with part two of Landon Donovan. What's your favorite Clint story? Oh, that's a good, oh, I'll tell you my favorite, I mean, it's disgusting, but it's my favorite. It tells you everything you need about Deuce. I've told you this before. So I walked into the training room one day, and Deuce was on the table with our team doctor, and I saw him just going, and I'm like, what the hell is going on here? I watched the doctor pull off his toenail, his big toe, literally bit by bit, pulled out. He had like gotten hit on his toe, was bleeding, and I watched him oh, rip hell. off for like 20 minutes, rip off his toenail. And I was like, God, what kind of like uh, numbing cream did you give him? He goes, nope, didn't give him any. He didn't want anything. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? I watched him ripped off his hotel nail. I was like, God damn. <laughs> yeah. Dude, Why would you was... be offered numbing cream and say no? Because he didn't, he didn't need it. <laughs> Some people just build different. <laughs>